the universe is young. As far as the overall lifetime of the universe, it's still in its relative infancy and has perhaps hundreds of trillions of years before it can effectively be said to be at an end. Still ahead are periods of time where types of stars will exist that literally can't exist now, for lack of enough time having been passed in order to form them. This has led to thinking such as a solution to the Fermi Paradox, that the reason we don't see evidence of alien civilizations is that not enough time has passed for very many of them to form, and that we're very early as far as such things go. This might lead to a future where there is an explosion of intelligence in the universe, and civilizations begin to appear with increasing regularity. But not just yet. At this point in time, they, and indeed we, are rare. As the universe ages, it will change. The dazzling galaxies we see today will completely change character as they become the abode of ancient stars, red and eventually blue dwarfs. There will be cinders of former giant stars and evaporating black holes. My guest today is an astronomer who studies the heavens and how it is, but also how it will someday be. Welcome to Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. John is joined by Christian Reddy. Christian has been an astronomer since the age of 13 where he worked at the Sproul Observatory at Swarthmore College. He has since worked at Space Telescope, Science Institute and later at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. He's now an instructor at the Launchpad Astronomy Workshop where he teaches writers, editors, filmmakers and other creative professionals about astronomy. Christian Reddy, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me, John. Now, Christian, you're an astronomer, and I'm an amateur astronomer, and I remember when, what initially got me interested in astronomy. It was seeing the planet Saturn through a small telescope and just seeing the rings, which were very obvious. What got you into astronomy? You know, I, I think uh, your experience with uh, a telescope mirrors mine, and I think just about anyone else who's ever had a chance to look through, you always kind of just have that certain... Awe, moment of awe and inspiration. But I think my interest, well, actually, I know that my interest in astronomy began long before I ever looked through a telescope. Growing up in the early 1970s, I was uh, becoming aware of things like television, and I would watch Star Trek, which at the time had uh, officially been off the air, but was still continued in syndication. So I would watch Star Trek reruns with my parents, and I loved the idea of getting in a starship and just traveling and visiting new worlds and new civilizations and exploring the universe. Then as time went on, I became interested in another show called Project UFO. And I was suddenly enamored with the idea of aliens and extraterrestrial life and understanding you know, unidentified flying objects and wanted to know what they were too. And I remember, I think I had to be around six years old when I was thinking about this problem this potentially existential threatening problem. I was in my bedroom and I was thinking, well, on the one hand, I really, really like astronomy. I really like the idea of studying the stars in the universe. But on the other hand, I'm also interested in learning about aliens and UFOs. But aliens and UFOs don't seem to want to make themselves known. So if I investigate them too much, they'll probably come and abduct me for sticking my nose where it doesn't belong. Whereas I don't think the universe will really care if I study it. So I made that decision at six years old to become an astronomer. So far, I have not been abducted. So I think my career choice was a, was a smart one. Yeah, but you, there, you have a problem. Um, mm. The universe will, is eventually will kill you. So it's worse. You know, I hadn't thought about that at the time. I didn't know that uh, we could be killed by universe. But yeah, you're right. There's a lot more ways to die in the universe than there is by the hand of aliens. <laughs> uh, but nevertheless, uh, between that and my obsession with science fiction and uh, my interest in the cosmos, yeah, I, I pretty much knew I wanted to uh, study astronomy or have something to do with it from a very young age. 
then when I was around 13 years old, I, um, well, really at the suggestion by my parents, I just rode my bicycle over to Swarthmore College, which was only a couple of miles from where I grew up. And there was an observatory there. And so I knocked on the door of the observatory and you wouldn't believe who shows up. There's this older gentleman, well, he was probably in his 40s or 50s at the time, but you know, when you're a little kid, that may as well just be, you know, that he may as well have been Gandalf, you know. Anyway, he shows up at the door and he's got a thick German accent and, you know, something like right out of central casting, you know, this German astronomer named Wolf Heinz. And I asked him, I said, hi, uh, my name is Christian Reddy. I was wondering if you needed uh, any help here around the observatory. And he said, yeah, sure, come back, see me tomorrow. So I went back the following day and he took me on and kind of was, he was my first mentor in astronomy. And he gave me my first job in the field using the Sproul Observatory 24 inch refractor. And he showed me how to make images of the stars on what were then photographic plates. These were the old Kodak glass plates with emulsion on one side and took images of selected stars in the sky and then brought them downstairs to the basement where we had this gigantic gigantic, complex, nasty machine, which would measure their positions down to, I think, something like one ten thousandth of a meter or something ridiculously highly precise. And what we were doing is we were doing what's now called astrometry. Actually, it was called astrometry back then. But we were doing astrometry. The idea is that we were measuring the positions of stars in the sky. And in particular, we were observing their parallaxes. In other words, we would watch nearby stars appear to oscillate in the sky back and forth over the course of the year. And that oscillation, of course, is due to the fact that the Earth is traveling around the sun and the parallax in turn revealed the star's distance. We were charting the universe. We were finding the distances to nearby stars. And occasionally we discover stars that didn't show up in any catalogs. So we were actually discovering stuff. I mean, there I was, I was 13 years old and I was actually doing what I hope to do someday from Star Trek. So not a bad way to get started. You know, it's interesting to think about that because I hear that over and over where people were inspired by Star Trek, particularly the original series. And you have to wonder how many engineers and scientists were first inspired by, by that television show. And my best guess is thousands and thousands. Um, and many. me and me too, you know, me too. I, I was watching the reruns of uh, Captain Kirk in the early 80s and I maybe, you know, maybe that I, was. I, I even decided after a while that the next generation was okay too. See, I was, that was what, 1987. So I'd have been 13. So that was my new Star Trek. So that kind of is my Star Trek, I suppose you could say, because this, uh, the original series seemed like this thing that was done long in the past, even though it had only really been um, just a little over a decade. It just seemed old. And then when, <laughs> uh, <laughs> when we go to the days of, of Captain Picard, it seemed fresh and new, and now that's, you know, long, long ago in itself. <laughs> um, now, astrometry. So now we still do this, but we do it in, a, in a, an even broader scale now with uh, by using the orbit of the Earth. You know, we can look at a star in one month and then a few months later look at it again and try to determine its distance. Um, right. So probably more accurately these days, I would assume, when you, you've got that big of a... A baseline available to you but does that really affect it well as a matter of fact back in back in the day <laughs> of the 1980s uh, our astrometry was relying on earth or earth's orbit as well uh, so the idea is that your baseline becomes two astronomical units you've got you know the distance from the sun to the earth in march and then the same distance over again in in uh in september let's say i see so you would take an exposure one month and then another exposure six months later and then compare yeah or to be really more precise we take exposures all throughout the year you know in other words like we had a set number of stars and of course we have some real world complications if a star is too close to the sun in one season that's going to affect so what you try to do is you try to take as many exposures over the course of of a year as possible and then even then you take you try to image that star over several years to help get rid of you know 
precision errors or errors in the telescope or, you know, real world complications like that, cloudy nights and so forth. Uh, so, yeah, we are taking advantage of the entire or twice uh, the Earth's semi-major axis. But now, uh, and I should also say that this technique was, you know, accurate to within about uh, about 100, 100 parsecs at, at best. Uh, one parsec is what 3.26 light years. So do the math, but we're not talking more than about 300 some odd light years. That's relatively close. Today, though, we now have a machine called the Gaia satellite, and it's able to make reliable parallaxes of some 1 billion stars out to, well, basically from here to the galactic center, about 26,000 light years away. So it's able to do work that is on a scale that is many orders of magnitude better than what we could do back in the 1980s with a 24-inch refracting telescope. But it was cool to be able to do something, you know, to be able to be to play a small part in the road that led us to Gaia. You know, one of the cool things, uh, things for me anyway, about, about those old refractors, we had one here at Washington University in St. Louis, and it was uh, it's a, it's a, a venerable old Alvin Clark made, you know, refractor. It's not anywhere near 24 inches, but it's, it's still fairly substantial. And um, now, who, how old is the refractor there? Yeah, it, it was, uh, well, actually, I should also say that the refractor is no longer there at Swarthmore College. Uh, it has since been removed from the observatory and has now, is now being restored in Arkansas. So it's going to go up for public use in a uh, public observatory down in Arkansas. But at the time, it was one of the largest I think at the time it was built, which would have been in the uh, early 1900s. I don't remember the year, but I want to say it was around like 1910, 1913, something like that. It was one of the world's largest telescopes, period. And as a refractor, it was extremely well suited to this type of work because it could make extremely razor sharp images, which is exactly what you have to have to do uh, this kind of precision work. So. It was old. I mean, by the time I got there in the early 1980s, it was already old technology. In fact, you know, as I said, we were taking images on photographic plates. Everything was analog. There was no digital anything. Even the clock was analog. A lot of the guidance on the on the stars had to be, you know, there was a clock drive moving the telescope against the apparent motion of the Earth's rotation, but you had to guide or tune that guiding yourself. So it really did mean, you know, sitting there looking through an eyepiece that picked up some of the light from the telescope that was heading to the camera and watching a guide star and just keeping that guide star centered, making constant manual adjustments. Uh, it was real old school astronomy, uh, even by uh, even by its day. As a matter of fact, to uh, measure the positions of the stars on those photographic plates, as I said, we went downstairs to this uh, big, gigantic machine, and initially we recorded the data on IBM punch cards. I mean, that's how old it was. It was, it was medieval even back then. So uh, imagine my delight when we got an Apple IIc with five and a half inch floppy disks to record our data on. Wow. <laughs> I guess you would have also found, you know, objects that were in the solar system moving around you know, an asteroid or something like that, it's something you'll see it in one one plate, but it's not there in the other. Would you run across uh, oddball stuff like that? Uh, I never did, no, uh, nor do I nor do I know if uh, anything like that was ever found at Sproul. But, but I will tell you one uh, interesting story that predates me. Uh, back in 1963, the previous observatory director, uh, Peter Van de Kamp, made headlines because he believed that he detected the wobble, a, a wobble in the motion of Barnard star. So as stars move across the sky, they exhibit something called proper motion. That's the apparent sideways motion across the sky that stars will make. And Barnard star has the highest proper motion of any star in the sky. That's because for two reasons. Number one, it's relatively close to Earth, but number two, it's also just has a, a high velocity around the galaxy. Well, anyway, Van de Kamp Thought, saw what he thought were oscillations in the proper motion of Barnard. And he concluded that there was at least one planet surrounding Barnard. And that drew 
apparently an awful lot of press. It drew a lot of international attention. And I was told tales of what was happening at the observatory about 20 years before I got there. Well, anyway, my boss, uh, who was appointed by Van de Kamp to succeed him as the director of Sproul Observatory, discovered that after the telescope's optics had been removed for cleaning and reinserted, that all the wobbling that Van de Kamp saw was just noise and wasn't real, and that there was no evidence for a planet around Barnard. But then, if I could fast forward the story to my college days, I went to Villanova University, where I was a student of, among other people, uh, Ed Guinan. And Ed Guinan recently worked with a international collaboration to use the radial velocity method that we use to measure binary stars to work out that there is, in fact, a real planet around Barnard. So I have the honor of working in two facilities that were instrumental in discovering a planet around Barnard Star. And I worked at those two places at exactly the wrong times to have any impact on the discovery whatsoever. You know, that's not so interesting now that I've said it out loud. You, <laughs> you will not be getting any credit for the planet around Barnard Star. Now, that star's particularly interesting. It's a red dwarf, right? That's right, yeah. Now, is it is it a really old red dwarf? Is it has it calmed down, or is it still you know a flare star as as some, they tend to be when they're younger? As far as I know, I believe um, I believe Barnard might not be quite so violent, uh, quite so active. Although we have to be a little bit careful about that because um, we know that, for example, Proxima Centauri is also a red dwarf star, and it's believed to be about the same age as the Sun, and it just showed a tremendously powerful flare uh, just last year. Uh, I don't know if Barnard uh, itself is known to be as uh, flaring a star, but but the fact is that you have a small star with a highly convective interior, so that's going to produce a very strong magnetic field. And because of its smaller size and conservation of magnetic momentum, it's going to rotate rapidly, so you're going to have a very strong and very twisted, tangled magnetic field. You know, if Barnard isn't already flaring, it's it's going to someday. So I don't know if that means uh, the real estate on Barnard B or Proxima B is, is worth investing in right now. But at the same time, red dwarfs are extraordinarily long-lived, mainly because of that convection, right? It's moving its hydrogen around, so it gets to use a lot more of the hydrogen than a larger star would be able to do that's not convecting like that. Now, they can last for billions upon billions of years. Do they ever get to a stage where the real estate value rises on a planet near one? They, they do. Uh, but, but you're right, though, going back to that point about using the hydrogen. Yeah, because their interiors are 100% convective, you know, if the star starts out presumably uh, in a very simple model as almost entirely hydrogen, probably with some helium and some metals thrown in there as well. And you're right, because of its convective nature, it's going to use up 100% of the hydrogen fuel available to it. So if you have, for example, a red dwarf star that's one-tenth the sun's mass, well, it's going to have the same amount of fuel to work with as our sun does in its core. But it's going to use 100, you know, but it's also going to burn that fuel very, very slowly. So you're right. These are extremely long-lived stars, only they're not their lifespans are not measured in the billions of years. They actually are measured in the trillions of years. I mean, that's that's really what's amazing about these things. These things will go for a long time. Uh, I think the lowest, your, the shortest lived red dwarf star is going to come in somewhere at around uh, 1.2 trillion years, while others can go as long as 10 to 12 trillion years. And that's nuts. I mean, our, our own sun, you know, we're looking at what, like, a, you know, it's currently about four and a half billion years old, and it has maybe about another five, maybe six billion years to go on the main sequence, but that's it, 12 billion years total. And we're talking about something that is just several orders of magnitude longer. So to answer your question, yes, uh, those stars will eventually evolve. And in so doing, we can expect a couple things that can affect the real estate values. Number one, we should expect those stars to become a lot more quiescent over time. 
Uh, the rotation will slow down because they're losing mass due to their own stellar winds. So we expect their rotations to slow down as their own magnetic field lines drag in their own solar wind. And that should ease up on the magnetic activity, i.e. flares. So we don't expect red dwarf stars to remain as uber deadly as they are when they're young, uh, certainly within like the first several hundred million, maybe a couple of billion years of their lifetimes. So we can expect a relatively lengthy period of uh, red dwarf quiescence. But if you have a red dwarf that has just the right mass range, around 16% the mass of the sun, they'll warm up and they will get a lot hotter as they evolve. And they won't actually become red giant stars, but they will get warmer. And if you have a situation like you do in the case of Barnard B, Barnard B is far enough away from Barnard that someday if Barnard uh, gets warm enough, the ice uh, shell could could thaw out on a planet like that. And you could have some very nice uh, opportunities for uh, a very Earth-like environment for billions of years. And you have the added advantage that you have trillions of years for evolution to occur. So you could have a situation where it's, it's you know, maybe in, in that exact situation, it may be more favorable for a civilization to eventually arise because of just the, the sheer amount of time that life would have to evolve towards it. I would think so. And I, and I think that red dwarfs present that really nice solution to uh, or a solution to the Fermi paradox, which is, you know, where is everybody? Well, maybe we are just among the first to show up in the universe. Maybe trillions of years from now, there'll be an age of red dwarf civilizations just enjoying life. I mean, you're, you're talking about the most common type of star in the universe. Come on, the odds, the odds of life showing up around those stars, especially in the distant future, has, has got to increase as time goes on. Well, and you could also make the case that you know, given that we're we're orbiting around this yellow, uh, <laughs> they always call it a dwarf, but I I, I have trouble saying that. It's more like, <laughs> and it's not yellow either. And it's just like, well, maybe we should like, be calling it a green giant. <laughs> Jolly green giant, yes. <laughs> but well, the, we, the the idea though is that you know, our our star is not permanent by any means. So perhaps it might be. A thought for the human future should we survive to go and colonize the nearest uh, red dwarf we can and simply move civilization there because that will give us you know a much much uh, longer lease on life than what we're going to have here with this star well you certainly uh yeah that certainly is the right idea and we couldn't ask for a better opportunity because proxima centauri is is the closest star to our solar system and you know in terms of cosmological distances we're talking what 4.2 light years away that's just down the cosmic street so if we can get to proxima b uh, the planet that presently lives in proxima's uh, so-called habitable zone then yeah that would be the next best place for uh, our descendants to migrate to certainly you know, migrating to places like Mars and uh, even the outer solar system, uh, like say the moons of Jupiter, is is great for a short-term solution. Uh, but uh, but as you point out, yeah, within a couple of billion years, uh, the sun's just not going to be very hospitable for for life. Uh, Earth will cease to be a, a hospitable planet. Even Mars will become inhospitable. I know it's hospital inhospitable already, but even if we manage to terraform it. Uh, we'll run out of uh, habitability on Mars, and I think we'll also see a, an erosion of habitability on the Jovian moons. So Proxima B is our is our next logical choice, and it's uh, it's a place that we need to start thinking about, you know, sooner rather than later. And by that, I mean in the in the cosmological timescales. Well, with the sun, you know, the sun's luminosity is increasing over time, so we're 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 going to start having issues with the star in the hundreds of millions of years. And so we definitely, it is, it is something we would have to look at. But thankfully, even if we can't get to Proxima B, it's so far in the future that it's just too distant, it's moved away. There is no shortage of other red dwarfs in the uh, Milky Way. It's by far the most common type of star there is. So you just grab one and um, colonize, so to speak. 
And, no. You, you make a good point, John. I, I I was making my statement without taking into account the fact that, yeah, you know, Proxima and the sun are moving. And by that point in the future, uh, when the sun has become inhospitable, Proxima and, Proxima and the sun will probably be too far. But you're right. There will probably be another red dwarf. I mean, most of the stars near the sun as it is are presently red dwarfs. Yeah. Uh, wouldn't be surprised if that were the case in a few billion years. Now, the other interesting thing about this is that about the habitability of these dwarf stars, there's also the orange dwarfs. The, <laughs> um, what are they, Type K, I think? Uh, type. Yeah. And some people have advanced that these would actually be even better than red dwarfs for habitability because they, you know, your habitable zone is further out. Mm -hmm. And and the star but the problem with that is, is that it's really hard to study any planets around these beaches because of their their size and brightness now sun-like stars like you know the type g star we have then you start getting into scarcer stars and that it's also been thought that maybe maybe this we're just in a really lucky position and you mentioned that we're early in the game we may be early in the game as a solution to the fermi paradox but if you look at all of the factors that go into how life arose on Earth and evolved, there was a lot of chance there and a lot of uh, almost unlikely, you know, circumstances like the formation of the moon, you know, through the glancing blow <laughs> theory and things like that, tides, you know, plate tectonics, all these things that had to be present that in some way contributed to life on Earth eventually evolving into, you know, us, a civilization. On that note, we have to go to break. We'll be back in a moment with Christian Ritty. If you'd like to support Event Horizon, you'll be pleased to know we've recently launched a Patreon. Link in the description below. Or alternatively, you can use your cellular telephone to scan the assemblage of squares on screen now. Be sure to like, subscribe, and share the video. And now, back to John. And we're back with astronomer Christian Reddy. Now, Christian, I joined you on a live stream on New Year's because of the uh, Ultima Thule flyby. Now, yeah. I haven't done any updates on that, but we've learned some stuff since then as as to what what this you know the characteristics of this object are, and it turned out to be really interesting. What have we learned since the flyby? Yeah, I think the biggest uh, surprise. Well, first of all, Ultima Thule just seems to be surprising us one moment after the next. Uh, you know, first it was this. Uh, it was expected to be this really lumpy bilobate object, and then it turned out to be a snowman. Well, that didn't hold up for very long because now we've gotten images down from New Horizons that show instead of a snowman, it's kind of like um, it's kind of like a walnut and a uh, misshapen hamburger patty or something like that. It, it's it's weird. Uh, both of these are are kind of. Flattish, uh, the larger object uh, named uh, uh, Thule is a little. Or wait a minute, I think I think the larger one is named Ultima. Yeah, the larger object uh, named Ultima is kind of uh, misshapen as sort of like a you know a, a patty shaped like structure. Then you have this walnut smaller object, and they're both kind of kind of aligned uh, along their long axes. So they're rotating. They're co-rotating. Uh, which basically is a nice way of saying they're they're spinning uh, around whatever the middle of the system is, and it's really just kind of not what any not unlike anything uh, anyone had expected, and so it's really great to see this because now it raises all kinds of new questions. Uh, assuming that Ultima Thule is a uh, is a normal typical Kuiper Belt object, you know, are they all like this? Are they all instead of being roundish objects, are they all flattish objects. The fact that they're flat and the fact that they're rotating along that flat axis makes a certain amount of sense. It makes the most sense if you think about a group of smaller objects that are just kind of in a mutual orbit. Uh, the smallest of the objects either get kicked out of the system or uh, accrete onto the system. And then eventually the two larger objects just kind of merge together along uh, perpendicular to their axis of rotation and you end up with uh, with two flat ish objects uh, co-rotating like this it's really interesting now is there is there other possibilities there could you have like a trilobate object form or is that just sort of not in the dynamics of this 
I, you know, I really don't know. Um, I think that would be a really cool question for the New Horizons team, and and I'm got my fingers crossed. I can hopefully talk to them after they get back from this week's meeting of the uh, uh, Planetary and Geological Society uh, down in Texas. So I'm that's one of the things that I want to find out as well. Is it possible to have more than two lobes? I do know this, uh, or I do understand this from. Uh, the Ultima Thule flyby, and that is most objects in the outer solar system are bilobate. Uh, in fact, even objects that started out in the outer solar system but ended up close by, such as uh, the comet uh, 67P that the Rosetta spacecraft visited, are bilobate. So a binary system like Rosetta's 67P or Ultima Thule seems to be common. I don't know if a triple or more object uh, or more lobe system is, is likely. I think it's largely going to be bilobate, but I'm not sure. And I wouldn't be surprised if we were surprised. You know, speaking of being surprised, what, and you know, as we were talking about sort of the the last few decades of astronomical research, the outer solar system, starting with the flyby of Pluto, is proving to be far, far more interesting than anybody ever imagined. You know, we used to think of it back in the 80s as this frozen wasteland, you know, that just produced comets and things like that. But now we're finding, as we actually probe it, we're finding out it's way more interesting, particularly Pluto, where, you know, it's it's this dynamic world, you know, and it yeah. makes you wonder what what awaits us when we look at these, these Kuiper Belt objects, you know, that eventually we start exploring them and or what are we going to find you know are they going to be just as dynamic as pluto are they going to be um it's just it's a really interesting thing because you literally have hundreds and or thousands of minor planets to explore and then you've got countless objects like ultimate Thule floating around out there and as we learn more about them they, they turn out they're far more interesting and what else is interesting about about them and ultimate Thule is how primitive they are you know these these are almost like fossils of the early solar system. And exactly. Yeah. And that's why that's why these are such interesting objects because you're right. They're these perfectly preserved. I mean, it you know, doesn't look like there's a whole lot of uh, cratering or a lot of impacts going on. Uh, you know, out there everything's moving so slowly that the impacts such as they are are really just these gentle mergers uh, producing objects like Ultima Thule. So you get this really pristine fossil record of what the early solar nebula was like because it hasn't really changed since the early solar nebula. It is effectively a piece of the early solar nebula. Uh, and I think that's tremendously exciting. As to how dynamic things are with Ultima Thule and uh, you know your typical Kuiper Belt object, probably not as interesting and dynamic as Pluto because Pluto has enough mass to pull itself into a spherical shape. You know, it can achieve hydrostatic equilibrium. But well, once you get spherical, now you can have geology. And yeah, it was a huge surprise to see Pluto with this incredibly geologically diverse uh, surface. In fact, it's the most diverse surface of any world in our solar system next to Earth. I don't know how how widely expected that was. I, I'm sure some Pluto experts were anticipating it. I mean, there was early work, well, there's early work on Pluto going all the way back to Clyde Tombaugh, but the most sophisticated work that was done was with the Hubble Space Telescope, and the modeling patterns were mapped out onto a sphere, and they matched up pretty well with uh, what New Horizons found. Uh, so when you get to Ultima Thule, on the other hand, because you lack the hydrostatic equilibrium, I think what is what they're likely to find and again i don't know i'm not an expert on on early planetary geology but it seems like what they're likely to find is more of more the results of things happening to ultima thule rather than things happening inside of it if that makes any sense like there wouldn't be any i wouldn't think that there would be any heat source inside ultima thule driving convection for example yeah far too small but but pluto is not and you know right. one of the also of interest is you know pluto has organic chemistry going on which mm -hmm. and and you know we know from um from meteorites associated with comets that there's probably a lot of organics out you know in the outer solar system and that you know this is these are the building blocks of life you know as a matter of fact i think they've actually found 
in um, a meteorite that fell in Australia back in the 60s, they actually found amino acids present in it. Now, this isn't biology, they're abiotic, but at the same right. time, they are what what the building blocks for biology. So, you know, there may be a connection between life on Earth and the outer solar system long ago in the past. I would think so. I mean, after all, even the comets that we see, uh, that we've uh, flown through, they contain amino acid chains. And, and you're right, they're not, they're not life, but you need them for life. And it, the fact that those building blocks uh, were most likely delivered to Earth via the outer solar system, via comets. Well, then that suggests, okay, you may not expect, to, you're not going to find, well, we wouldn't expect to find life in the Kuiper Belt. But the origins of life, yeah, could very well come to us courtesy of the Kuiper Belt. You could, uh, you could say that the stage was set for us in the outer solar system. Exactly, right. The ingredients were shipped in. You know, think of it this way. The outer solar system is the cold storage locker where the, where the food of life originates. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's the refrigerator that <laughs> where, where the potatoes are kept. Um, <laughs> now, Christian, I have one last question for you that completely switches gears. Okay. But it's a, it's a hot topic, and I personally wonder if we're going to find something much bigger than a Kuiper Belt object in the outer solar system. Planet Nine. As an astronomer, what do you think the odds are that we're going to find that? Oh boy, <laughs> my expert uh, opinion, which is worth exactly as much as anyone else's, right? Um, I, I think the evidence that there is a planet nine, I mean, the work that Mike Brown and Constantine Batigan and others have done, it's hard to imagine a situation where there isn't a planet out there. You know, we can start from the very first principles of, okay, the universe is always gonna surprise us, expect the unexpected, but look at all that evidence that we see, you know, the, the, this arrangement of these distant solar system objects lined up in such a way. Um, you know, it's not, it's not hard to imagine that could be done by a planet, but we don't have to imagine. We can run computer simulations and we can see how a planet matching Planet Nine's description generates uh, the orbits that we see. Uh, as a matter of fact, that's how uh, Planet Nine was I don't want to say discovered, but really demonstrated to be a viable model. Uh, so in my humble opinion, I think it's probably out there. But like like anybody else, you know, I got to see the data. We got to see that image. And I know that uh, astronomers around the world are working very hard uh, to get that. But it just might take us longer to find it uh, than we expect. I mean, we are talking about something that's you know, could very well be easily lost in the middle of the plane of the Milky Way galaxy. Um, if that's the case, then we are kind of really having to wait. We may just have to wait for the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope to come along. Uh, that will have the dedicated cadence uh, to be able to catch anything moving, uh, even at Planet Nine's uh, proposed magnitude. So if, if it isn't found before LSST comes on, then I would like to think uh, it would probably be found, almost certainly be found in the coming decade. Um, if not, then I really want to know how is it that you get everything to arrange itself the way it's being arranged. And so far, I haven't really seen a, a terribly convincing argument for that yet. I, I, for one, hope we find it because as we were talking about Pluto, it's it's interesting to think about what it might be like. You know, if it exists, what what is this distant planet like? Is it, you know, in light of our discussion on Pluto, you know, how strange it ended up being. But we'll save talk about that until after they find it, and we'll uh, hopefully you'll come back and we can actually talk about Planet Nine as an existing object someday. That would be a lot of fun. It's fun to imagine the far future of the universe. Will we still be around in some form? What will humans trillions of years in the future be like? Envisioning that, if it's possible for us to last that long, is difficult. But the realities of the universe in the far future will dictate what we do. To keep going, we would need to harness the energy of things like red dwarfs, and perhaps even black holes. Eventually, though, time will be up, and continuation in this universe will not only be increasingly difficult, if not impossible, but there may not even be a point to living in a dead universe. At what point is existing for very long periods of time not desirable? What's it like to be a consciousness trillions of years old? 
I'll probably never know. I'm too early in the game, and I'm fine with that. It's enough for me to simply imagine what the future will be like. Ah, <sighs> another episode in the can. Hey, Anna. I thought you said the thing Ross was working on was 21 days away. Well, it's been moved forward. Yeah, I know. How do you know? Have you been reading my emails to Ross Campbell? I didn't know you were... You've been talking about it openly, with me in the room. Oh well, you may as well tell them, Sherlock. I will indeed. Next week we have a very special show indeed. I'll be joined by the co-hosts of The Well Podcast, filmmaker Brandon Edgens and Anson Mount, who also happens to portray Captain Christopher Pike in Star Trek Discovery, our first captain on the show. See you then. <laughs>